welcome everyone to uh, this live streaming session that focuses on women in STEM. Um, so we'll be having two guests today, and um, here is our first guest. <laughs> Could you please introduce yourself? Uh, yes, my name is Johnny L. Lawson, and I am a new assistant professor at New York University. and I'm in the biology department there. Um, so can you tell us what was undergrad and grad school for you like as a woman in STEM? Um, yes, so as a, I went to undergrad at the University of Georgia, go Bulldogs. Um, I was a biochem major and initially I was on the pre-med track and you know my whole goal was to go to med school and then my junior year, I was required to do research um, for my degree. So I joined an organic chemistry lab and began to really enjoy the process of research. And then I stayed in the lab um, for another year and then took a gap year to decide what I wanted to do. And I ultimately began to apply to graduate programs while still working in that same lab. So for graduate school, I went to Emory University um, in Atlanta, and that was a really eye-opening experience. I feel like um, during that time, I grew quite a bit in, as a scientist and as a person, because it was uh, you know, my first time really being out there in the world like, on my own. So um, to address your question as like what it was like to be a woman in science, I think um, perhaps during my time at Emory was when I began to see some of the imbalance, at least in the system where most of the professors were male, um, not many were female, and some of the, like, uh, yeah, you just had different expectations and um, received different kinds of feedback um, if you were like a female student versus a male student. Um, not from all professors, but um, there were those times that really made you question if you belonged um, in the PhD program, you know, and should be doing something else. Yeah. 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 So can you tell us about the research um, that made you change your mind about med school? Um, yes, I think I'm, like everyone says STEM, but there's this new kind of move, movement to call it STEAM, to add the A in there, um, because there is this artistic kind of creative aspect to science, and that's something that really spoke to me where every day you can just walk into the lab and you know you can figure out something new. There's really something free form about the process. Of course, it's structured, but you know your questions carry you through through all the experiments. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it, and the idea of being like in an office kind of uh, yeah stressed me out. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to do that. But then also with med school, I felt like. I don't know, it just felt like research spoke more to who I was as a person. So I, I went that direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, were there any notable mentors or role models that you look, look up to while you're trying to decide if you want to go into research or during your um, PhD or your postdoc training, did you find um, people that you tend to uh, lean a lot on and if you look up to them? Um, yes. So. <laughs> My graduate advisor, actually, uh, David Katz, he um, was a huge source of support for me, like during my graduate times and then also as a postdoc. So I think he like really exemplified what it meant to be like a mentor in research because you know he challenged me, but he also was like supportive of like my ideas. And if I wanted to do a postdoc, if I wanted to go in a different direction, like he was supportive and. Pro Help me find the resources I needed to actually like pursue those different things. So I would say he was a big um, help in like keeping me in science. Mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. So what did you do for your PhD? Like what was uh, like what did you focus on, and then what did you find that surprising that you didn't expect to learn about? Um, yes. So um, as a PhD student, um, I was looking at. How do you go from very different cell types, so sperm and egg, to one cell type that essentially becomes every cell in your body? So it's like two very specialized things fused together create something that's unspecialized. How does that happen? Like, what are some of the events that need to occur? 
So I was focusing on um, the role of one particular enzyme that's responsible for, you could say, erasing um, cellular uh, identity or cell cellular memory. So if you get rid of this enzyme um, from oocytes, embryos, that zygote doesn't differentiate and become everything else. It just stays what it, it stays and thinks it's an oocyte. So it doesn't forget that it used to be an oocyte. Um, and what was surprising in that particular um, project was that if you still had the enzyme, but it was say half functional, you could still get some um, animals to survive until birth, and very few of them made it to adulthood. And in that case, they had very weird behaviors. So they would like be very OCD, they would jump constantly in the corner, they would do backflips, they excessively dig. So they had these really aberrant phenotypes, all because we changed something in oocytes that didn't completely erase like cellular identity. Is that, does that research relate to what you're doing right now um, as a professor? Um, yeah, so yes, it does in, in some respects. So that whole process of um, going from two different cell types to one cell type, um, there's something called epigenetic reprogramming. So it's that kind of erasure step to set that blank slate for the next generation. Um, during my time um, as a graduate student, I became interested in kind of the converse of that process, where instead of erasing everything and having a blank slate, there is some information that needs to be maintained between generations. And um, I began to like really try to figure out, okay, what are those types of information that are maintained between generations? And how does a parent's experience and their environment, how does that influence what gets passed between generations, and that's, yeah, so that's the relation there. So focused on one side during my graduate work, and now, like, I'm really interested on the, in the other side mm -hmm. of them, yeah. Um, so we have some questions from the audience. Um, someone is asking, and it's really cool that you work on embryos and adults. How hard is that? Um, it is really hard. So I, I work with C. elegans, um, and that is, um, a great model organism to study questions relating to adults and embryos because they lay eggs so it's very easy to collect the embryos and the adult uh, worms have really great behaviors that you can um, focus on you can also change their environments um, pretty easily so you can really control a lot um, of different experimental details in the system so it's 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 not as difficult as you would think what would you say is um, an advantage of using C. elegans? Um, for my interests, they have really fast generation times. So every three to four days, you have a whole new generation. So you can follow multi-generational phenotypes. You can collect a lot of embryos. You can have like huge population of adults. It's, yeah, it's a great mm -hmm. system. And they have, they're one of the only organisms where the entire um, connectome, meaning that we know all the neurons that exist in a worm, and we know who's talking to who. So it's a really great system to look at um, neurobiology as well. So mm -hmm. understanding how an organism is sensing its environment to then change what it passes on to its progeny. And how close is a worm to a human? Um, it's pretty close. It's like, um, I believe we share like 60% of our, our genes with, the, with worms. It's pretty... It's quite, it's similar in a lot of respects. Like one of the molecules I'm interested in um, is homologous to a really important molecule in humans. Um, and it performs some of the same functions. So it's really um, nice to be able to kind of learn basic processes in the worm and translate that to other organisms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Were you working with other model organisms before you moved on to C. elegans or were you always a worm person and you stayed in it? I um, So during my graduate work, I was working with mice. So all of the work on the sperm egg, you know, embryo, that was all mice. Mm -hmm. And then before that, I was working with plants. Do, do you have a favorite? Well, obviously you're on <laughs> to the worm now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's really hard. Like between the mouse and the worm, yeah, they're both, they're pretty equal. They have their advantages mm -hmm. and disadvantages. Yeah, 
Um, can you speak about how being a woman in STEM has affected your journey? Um, we heard early today about some of the challenges of being in academia, so I was wondering if you can talk more about that. Um, yes, so I think a lot of the challenges, uh, I was actually having a conversation with someone about this the other day where there's this discussion of the leaky pipeline and um, someone once said that it's not necessarily a leaky pipeline, it's like you're, you're being forced out in a way because there are a lot of things in the system that don't support, say, if you want to become a parent in science. And you are starting to see some of those things change. Like here they have you know, rooms for nursing and they're beginning to think about like paternal leave and things like that. Um, so it is getting better in that regard, but there are still a lot of ways that the system is set up that don't necessarily support um, women continuing on in science. And when you're facing those challenges, what ways are you trying to overcome those challenges and what's, what's been your support system like when you're encountering these challenges as a woman in STEM? Um, yeah, so I guess my biggest support system would be other women in STEM, so really going to people who have similar experiences um, to me and just basically like just ha having a session where just like completely just like let it all out. It's like this happened to me, like, you know, there was this microaggression, like, you know, like, yeah, me too. Like, <laughs> I also experienced that, but just like finding community and having people to like, you know, listen to you. And then also like if they face a similar situation, they can give you advice on how to handle that situation. So it's really like having a good community has really helped me deal with some of the yeah, microaggressions that you know I've faced being you know, a woman in science. Yeah. Yeah. While we're on the topic of challenges, how has your personal journey been challenging and how did you overcome it? Um, yes, so my personal journey I guess started in Georgia. Um, did all, most of my schooling as I say in Georgia. And then I realized, um, I, you know, I felt comfortable and I realized that I, in order to really grow and develop more as a person, I needed to kind of extend outside of my bubble. So I decided to um, do a postdoc somewhere very different, which was Boston. So I got there and it was, to me, kind of a culture shock because, you know, it just seemed like people were different than what I was used to. It was cold. Um, I was far from like my like friends and family. Um, but, you know, I adapted and began to, like, get comfortable, and then three months into my postdoc, my advisor told me that we were going to be moving the lab to Switzerland. So, I was like, well, this was a big change for me, just moving to Boston, like, do I go to Switzerland? But I was like, you know, I'm already on this train, like, I will never get this opportunity again in my life, so, like, let's do it. Um, so that was, it was pretty challenging to move not once but twice um, in the span of a couple of years, you know, thinking that like, oh, you know, I'm comfortable here and, you know, I don't necessarily want to move, but I feel like I need to move to get some perspective on life. And I think it was challenging because, yeah, being in a place where they don't really speak the same language as you, they have slightly different, like, um, cultural norms, and just feeling like, you know, just being uncomfortable, like a lot of the time, I feel like that was when I, I grew the most as a person. Um, and then now that I'm back, I feel like I've gotten a new perspective on life. And, you know, even my science has been really informed by like this whole process, mm -hmm. yeah. How did you manage not just moving from home in the US, but also overseas? And then what about the science, like, what about, sorry, what about the science was worth the journey? Like what was worth moving so far away <laughs> from home? Um, what was worth it? I, it was really the experience. I mean, like both of the institutions, like I was at for my post offer were great institutions, you know. I would say moving to Switzerland, the pay was so much better. Let's <laughs> uh, say like postdocs don't necessarily make, it's gotten better since, you know, it was, first a postdoc, but you know, it's depending on where you live, it's not a lot of money. Um, and there are a lot of people who struggled on a postdoc salary. So moving to Switzerland and getting that pay increase was amazing. Um, and the institution 
was great and like I guess making those connections with people I would never really have interacted with otherwise I think that was also uh, well worth it mm -hmm. so it was really more about expanding kind of like my scientific world <laughs> Would you suggest studying overseas? Um, yes, I mean, I would suggest studying maybe somewhere that's not close to home for anyone. Like even if it's like you're in Georgia, go to Boston or you know, go to California, just really getting outside of a place where you feel comfortable because like it's outside of that bubble where you really make the most changes in your life, mm -hmm. where, where you grow the most, so yeah. I would say, yeah, go overseas, it's fun. I mean, to get paid to live somewhere else, fantastic, mm -hmm. yeah. Would you say that the scientific community in Switzerland was really different from in the US? Um, yes, yes and no. Um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's very similar. It's just like, sometimes like the, the cultural norms will inform how like different institutes are run, but for the most part, I feel like the science was, was I mean, it's science is science, <laughs> so I think it was it was very comparable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after you went to grad school, what did you, what? How did you decide on pursuing a postdoc, and then how did you go from becoming a professor? Yeah, I feel like um, for me, there's always like a, a gut check every year to decide how am I feeling? Am I still liking this? Am I not liking this? So it was always constantly just a thought process of like evaluating, you know, am I still enjoying this? Is it worth it? Do I continue on doing science? So there were times where I was thinking of going into other careers, um, like science writing was something that I got really interested in as a graduate student and I was thinking of going that route and just like weighing the options and just like, you know, maybe I just want to keep doing research just for a little bit longer just to see like, you know, see what else I can find. And I feel like that was probably what has kept me on this journey is just, you know, I'm still really interested in the questions, you know, I'm, I want to continue to pursue this route. And it's just really about evaluating like where you are at that moment in life and if that the decision to like, you know, choose whatever particular type of career it really just depends. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you became a professor, does it did it feel really different? Like in terms of research, was it very like was it more challenging, or was it do you feel more like you have to focus on other stuff like your services to the community or like teaching mm -hmm. versus like how do you weigh that? Um, so I must say I've only been here for two two months, <laughs> so I'm like brand new. Um, the challenges, I mean, it is, it is very different than what I was doing in the postdoc because there I was just focusing on doing experiments. Now it's like, it's almost like running a startup where you have to like do a lot of administrative stuff on top of like getting the science going. So for like the first month I've been ordering reagents, it's like ordering equipment, trying to like start from ground zero to like, even though I've had a lot of support in the department, I still have to like get my lab up and going, so at least initially, it is very different from, from the postdoc, mm -hmm. um, because you have to, yeah, start a business, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So what's your day-to-day -day like as a professor? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the day, I mean, um, so uh, I, I come in, I usually like look at emails, answer emails for like, a good couple of hours, probably throughout the day, even though I should not be answering emails all throughout the day. I'm like, right now, I'm ordering a lot of stuff, like pricing out things. I'm getting the, like my tech and rotating student, like up and running, helping them with experiments, answering their questions, um, like interacting with other faculty members, like, you know, maybe I need advice on something. So I go and ask, you know, someone down the hall, like, hey, I have this problem, like what do you think? Um, it, it's, it's very variable from day to day, but it's usually a mix of just trying to figure out how to get things up and running at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So do you teach, and what is your favorite subject in your teaching philosophy? Um, I don't teach currently. I will start teaching next year, mm -hmm. genetics. And uh, my teaching philosophy is I would say like giving people the confidence to go and find out the information for themselves. Mm -hmm. 
So it's like, you know, you have to have a foundation, of course, but there's something about really like taking your education in your own hands and going and finding like the proper sources of information to like inform yourself. Mm -hmm. So like giving people like the feeling to know that they can do that and find good sources and teach themselves. Mm -hmm. I would say that's yeah. Are you teaching like a, a first year or a second year genetics course or is it like a more senior? It's a more senior course, yeah. yeah. Um, what advice would you give to professors wanting to make STEM more accessible, accessible to women and what can be fixed to make things better? Good question. Um, I would say, yeah, doing things like they are starting to do, like have nursing rooms <laughs> accessible, um, having resources for um, parents. Like one thing that can be done is maybe having more grants to support people who need to maybe take a little bit of time off um, if they have kids, like in grad school or during the postdoc, to be able to return to the workforce. Because there are a lot of people who have a nonlinear path in science, right? So it's a lot of people can't come back because of the way the system will exclude them because it's like, oh, you've been gone for a couple of years. That doesn't look good on your CV, but it's like there's a reason why people need to take time off. So I feel like having more, making it easier for people to be able to come back would also um, really help. At your university, are there any initiatives or programs that also support um, these kind of people who are running into issues? Um, yeah, there are a lot of support groups. So another thing I, I would say that's really important is to have communities that people can um, access and rely on um, when they are having issues. So like, there is like a woman in science group, for example, like at NYU that really like is there as a resource for women in science. <laughs> Um, what is your favorite part of research and what is the most exciting data or result that you have collected? Um, the most exciting part of being in research is that no day is exactly the same. So that's why I kind of struggled with the question you asked about what's my life, my day to day life like as a professor. It changes depending on the day and I think that's, it keeps it really exciting. So that's something that I really love about research. Also, just like being the first person to like know something, it's really it's really exciting. Um, I guess my most exciting result is figuring out that worms also don't like to be alone. <laughs> um, it's actually stressful for them, and they communicate that stress to their babies. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was like a really cool result. Yeah. When you um, are doing experiments and when they don't work, how do you kind of like? cheer yourself up to be like, it's okay, let's try this again, or like what kind of ways do you, um, I guess not let that get to me. Get to you, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not going to lie, when I was a graduate student, it got to me like really bad, this like, the uncertainty and like things not working, um, but realizing that you know, if I do my best, the result is what it is. You know, you can't change that. You just think about ways to address, you know, what might have gone wrong or think of new ideas for how to test a different hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So just really focusing on the journey of it and not just the results because I feel like that's where a lot of people get caught up is, oh, like I really wanted that one result, but it's like, it's, it's a process, and I think finding joy in the process is really like how I've shifted my expectations of you know if something works or not. Yeah, yeah. and then also to cheer myself up, I like gummy bears. You know, I eat a couple of those. <laughs> so, so yeah. Okay. Um, so going back to what you just talked about, where I'm still like being alone. So in your, your talk, you talked about how it's like it has to do with something in the environment. And so how do you, exactly do you model isolation? Um, like, for example, kind of similar to the COVID situation, like how do you single out the worm and then how do you test that? Mm -hmm. So um, worms, you just take them, pick them up, they grow up on plates and typically they'll lay eggs, those eggs hatch. 
and there are a lot of worms that grow up on the plate. So what I began to do is just take worms as their eggs, put them on the plate, so when they hatch, they're by themselves. They begin to grow up, and then when they start to lay eggs, the first few eggs they lay, I isolate them, so it's kind of like this generational isolation, mm -hmm. and that's how I like keep them by themselves, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what um, other factors control um, their like social behavior? Yes, so worms secrete these molecules into the environment um, called the sericides or pheromones, and those molecules give them the sense of their social environment. Um, so it turns out if you have too many of those, too many sericides, pheromones in the environment, that is also very stressful for an animal um, because it begins to think, oh, resources are limited, there are too many of us around, and then they switch their developmental program and go into Something called dower. So, yeah, their pheromones, scare sides are another thing that regulate this social environment. That's really cool. Um, so, if money and time wasn't an issue, what's kind of the dream experiment for you to do? Yeah, so my ultimate goal is really to kind of like draw this line from environmental um, cue to initial sensing and apparent of that environment at the neural circuit level. So understanding that part and then how that information at the neural circuit level is communicated to the germline. And then understanding the changes that are happening in the germline that are passed on to the next generation and ultimately how that next generation is interpreting the information that it's gotten from its parent. Mm -hmm. So like really just drawing a line through all of those. Um, that is like my dream. That is my like scientific journey <laughs> from here on out. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit more about the neuronal stuff um, and how the worm could, like how, how is the neural system in the worm basically? Yeah, so worms have 302 neurons um, and there are a set of neurons that are called chemosensory neurons that actually project these ciliary endings, so like little cilia out into the environment that can actually sense all the different chemicals that are present there. Um, so that's like one way it gets a sense of not only its social environment, but just whatever else is out there, like metabolites or bacteria and everything. So that initial sensing is happening at that chemosensory level, and then that's communicated on down to um, other neurons like interneurons and then ultimately motor neurons and other tissues. So. Um, and then another question is, what are you looking forward to most in the next year? In the next year? Um, uh, getting, getting more trainees and getting money. <laughs> That's, uh, those are my goals at least. But I, I am looking forward to, I don't know, just getting more solid in this new um, position. Mm -hmm. How, what kind of... Um, things are you looking for in graduate students who are applying to your lab and how could undergrads for example who are interested in going into grad school like what would help them to do that i guess i would say getting research experience early on is something that will help um, any undergrad really um, get into graduate school and a characteristic that i think um, that my previous advisor that's really important for anyone who's like going um, who's going to join a lab and become a graduate student is uh, trainability so the ability to just like you know just want to learn be curious and not necessarily be a know-it-all if that makes sense yeah. so it's like how can you learn and be trained if you know everything or think you know everything so it's just really about like someone who's like curious and willing to learn like that's probably the biggest quality um, that I would look for in a graduate student. Um, and then to end the session, what is a piece of advice you would like to give to current students? Um, get hobbies. <laughs> uh, you need to have a good balance between work and life and don't think your success in lab um, is any indication of you as a person. Um, you know, just 
really find that balance between you know, being a scientist, but also being someone who's interested in horticulture or something, you know? So I would say like find a hobby, find balance um, and outlets for you to like relieve whatever stress may come to you in graduate school.